Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. The book of Jonah is about much more than a giant fish. It's about a series of events, pleasant and troubling, big and small in the prophet's life. They are events arranged by God to teach Jonah about his heart and bring him closer to God. The lessons Jonah needed to be taught 2,500 years ago are lessons God is still trying to teach his people today. Our next guest says most of us know the story of Jonah for the big fish, who at best has a walk-on or swim-on role. The book is far more about God's care for a recalcitrant prophet who preaches probably the worst evangelical message in history and sees a city converted. But can he himself accept the good news that comes through him to others? He goes on to say how many Christians are more like Jonah than they may realize. And he brings the text to life for readers to examine their own motives and affections. In exploring this resource, readers will find a God who relents, a God who is sovereign, and a God who is present among the mercies and trials of life. Our next author doesn't leave readers in the judgment and spiritual arrogance of Jonah. He shows them the good news that the Lord is in charge, even over those who try to run from him. Jonah thought of himself as someone who wasn't in much need of God's grace, but he found his heart exposed by the unwanted call to bring grace to the Ninevites. Our next author writes, We too are exposed by the story as those who are very much in need of grace and for whom abundant grace is provided in Jesus. In Do Good is a professor of Old Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary. He received his PhD at the University of Cambridge in 1992, his Master's of Divinity at Westminster Theological in 1989, his Bachelor's at the University of Edinburgh in 1981. He also served as a missionary in Liberia, West Africa, before attending Westminster and planted churches in Oxford, England, Fallbrook, California, where my daughter was born, Grove <laughs> City, and Glenside, Pennsylvania, and I am from Pittsburgh. He's the author of Ezekiel and the Leaders of Israel, Esther and Ruth, Daniel, and Song of Songs in the Reformed Expository Commentary, as well as many other titles. Here to discuss his new book, Jonah, Grace for Sinners and Saints, is Ian DeGuid, uh, spelled D-U-G-U-I-D. Ian, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you very much. You have a stellar background in places that have uh, so much meaning to me, Fallbrook, California. <laughs> I adopted a newborn baby out of Fallbrook Ooh. Hospital. Uh, so um, most people don't know where Fallbrook is. They know where uh, Joshua Tree National Forest is in San Diego. So if you kind of triangulate, you'll find yourself in Fallbrook. Uh, and it's a beautiful community. Uh, and you spend some time in Pennsylvania, which is my home. Uh, so going all the way back to your youth, uh, where are you from? What was your theological influence? And what was your journey to faith like that would call you to a lifetime of ministry, but in um, the personalization of the theological? So I was uh, born to a Scottish family that was living in exile in England, hence my attachment later on to the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a Christian family. Uh, and as I was a teenager growing up, I started to realize you can't just inherit your faith. It has to be something that's yours as well. And that's the point at which I personally committed my life uh, to Christ. It was not a dramatic transformation uh, so much as a growing realization of the truth of things that I've been taught before. Uh, I was uh, headed towards an engineering program, and uh, then when I was uh, probably about 16, a uh, standard youth group meeting challenged the people there to, about what they were going to do with their lives. So I said, Lord, if you want me to be a pastor, I'd, I'd like you to show me something in my reading tonight. So I got home and I opened up the book of Romans, which is where I'd been reading, and I came across a passage where Paul says, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel. And that was awkward. I'd not been planning to find anything. 
Um, but over the course of the next few weeks and months, the Lord pressed it upon me. That was his call for my life. Uh, I continued on the engineering track. That was the counsel I received, that if you're going to pastor people, you, you've got to know what it's like to live in a regular, ordinary life. Uh, so I studied engineering, worked in the oil industry in Scotland for a couple of years after that, uh, and then used my uh, engineering experience in the mission field in uh, Liberia, West Africa. I was electrical engineer for the Christian radio station hospital there, which was a great preparation for seminary. Mm. Uh, then went to, uh, to seminary, and uh, after that, uh, went to, to back to England to do a PhD in Old Testament. Never intending to be a professor, I, I just wanted to be a pastor. Uh, but it was a way of connecting with people in England. And at the end of that time, we were involved in church plants in Oxford uh, for three years. Uh, and when that, uh, the door closed the door on that, uh, and he opened another door into teaching in the U.S., uh, we came across the States, and we've been here ever since, uh, in California, in western Pennsylvania, now in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, but, yeah, I still can't decide what I want to be when I grow up, so I've, I've tried to plant churches alongside teaching, uh, which really forces me to connect the academic work that I'm doing with the, the needs of the church, which has been really good for me. Well, for somebody who's only been <clears throat> in the States a short period of time, you have an excellent mastery of the language. <laughs> so I think I, I've managed to communicate across the, the, the language boundary. You know, they say that uh, England and America are two nations separated by a common language. Yeah, I'm, I still trip over things that I say that I don't realize are particularly British, and then somebody says, wow, that's, I've never heard that before. <laughs> it's it's and it's, it's quite 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 interesting. So uh, you go down the engineering path, uh, and you're called to ministry, and you uh, pursue Old Testament studies. Uh, this is quite quite um, uh, in my experience, uh, growing up in the Old Testament world. Uh, 44 years in the synagogue, uh, mm -hmm. then coming to faith, finding that most of the uh, Christian community that I interact with uh, knows little or nothing uh, at all about the Old Testament, that it has been cast aside as if the Bible began with the book of Matthew. Uh, and that uh, the watershed moment would be when Mr. and Mrs. Christ had a little boy named Jesus. Uh, <laughs> and the understanding of the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 or the promises of Genesis 12 and 3 and the uh, Genesis 15 and the first uh, uh, real vision we have of Jesus in Genesis 22 as the ram caught in the thicket wearing a crown of thorns and we begin to pursue this whole journey into an understanding of the seed of the woman uh, that's been cast aside by most of Christendom uh, and yet this has become your area of expertise not only to preach it but to write it and teach it and I mm. want to honor you and thank I you. want to thank you and to uh, commend you uh, as a peer uh, to say thank you for embracing the entirety of the full counsel of heaven. And that's mm. exactly what is contained in the pages of this book, is the full Absolutely. counsel of heaven from Genesis to Revelation and nothing missing. Mm. And half a book does not make a book. And you can't start in the middle, as a matter of fact. And as a fellow biblicist, uh, I don't call myself a theologian, but a biblicist, uh, I believe that if we were to take a look at the true historical context of Scripture, that the last three words of the Old Testament are, it is finished and that the New Testament began after that event for the end of the Mosaic Law, for the sacrifice for sin had now been fulfilled. Now this new covenant came into being. 
and it's kind of an unusual but very defendable biblical position to take uh, from one Old Testament. Uh, I, I don't ever refer to myself, I'm, I'm referred often as a scholar, but, but I, I don't claim uh, to be one. Um, it's certainly not my pursuit. Uh, it, it's just my daily walk with the Lord is, mm-hmm. is, is the best I can do <laughs> each and every day. Uh, but I'm sure that that's something that might resonate with you if you think about it in context, uh, that as a Jew, that as I read the scriptures, that I see John as the last Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist, uh, because he died before Jesus, and then the ending and saying the same words that the priest says as he cuts the throat of the Paschal Lamb, uh, it is finished, are the same words that Jesus says on the cross, that, the, that is the summation and the beginning and the end of the Old Testament. And now we then come into this new covenant relationship that was prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 31. Yes, I mean, the, the, whichever way you order the Old Testament, it leaves you with an, a sense of incompleteness. You know, in our order that we have in our English Bibles, we end with Malachi with the expectation of, of Elijah coming and, uh, and the, the, the Messianic hope. Uh, if you order it the way that the Hebrew Bible does, you end with with Second Chronicles, uh, with with the return from exile. Uh, and you're left saying, okay, this can't be the end of the story. We can't just stop here. There's, there's got to be something more than this. You know, we've recapitulated in, in First and Second Chronicles from Adam to the return from the exile. What what more? You know, the the, the Lord of Glory is doing doing more than this in order to fulfill all those great Old Testament promises. Um, and of course, Jesus tells us uh, about you know, the disciples on the road to Emmaus uh, that the essence of the Old Testament is the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. Yes. And the New Testament is simply unpacking that. If you understand the Old Testament, then a lot of things New Testament scholars argue over become really easy. Uh, and if you don't understand it, then it's very easy to get off on a wrong track and misunderstand the New Testament. You bring up an interesting point. The Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, it's the one I read, ends with a promise, with a blessing. Uh, The Christian Bible ends uh, in the Old Testament Malachi with a curse. Mm. Now, when I take a look at the motivation, I have to go back to your uh, roots and uh, a king named James who uh, had uh, the desire to reorder things and and become more uh, a part of of the picture and then the the uh, um, strong anti-jewish roman influence that uh, preceded him uh, that forced uh, certain alterations to take place and uh, when we read in the english which is um, a beautiful language as a second language, uh, but the biblical language of, not the biblical thought, but the biblical language of the Greek and the Hebrew. Uh, Mm -hmm. There is no expression of Greek thought uh, contained within the scriptures. It's all Hebrew thought, uh, Greek just being the language. So what was fascinating for me when I came to faith at age 44, was understanding what the Septuagint was. And uh, to me, it became a code and said, okay, if this is how you translate the Hebrew into Greek, then how do I go back from the Greek to the Hebrew so that I can put the New Testament back in contextual thought, which is an expression of Hebrew thought, not an expression of Greek thought, and how beautifully complete and how exquisite the cinematography is of the greatest movie of all creation, the book of Revelation, of Mm. what was and what is and what is to come in this cinematic portrayal of something that is extraordinary. And then all of the parables uh, presented the way that I was raised in uh, Judaism through the teaching of parables, which 
hasn't changed in thousands of years, where we find that the answer is in the middle of the parable. Uh, this was the learning, this was the system in which I grew up in. And so when it came time for me as a believer, uh, when I came to faith at age 44, out of rabbinical teaching, out of Talmudic teaching, out of parabolic, if you will, or parabolic, I wonder what the word is. <laughs> it's uh, 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 out of a, a world of parabolas. Uh, <laughs> then um, uh, as I read uh, Jesus' teachings, um, I understood why he was scolding the disciples. Uh, you know, are, they, they, they were fascinated by the parable, uh, but they said, but we don't understand what it means. And he said, what, what, how, are you so dull? Uh, and, and, and of course, this becomes that unlearned, unschooled reference to Peter. Mm. He hadn't been raised in the parables. He hadn't been raised in the text. He was a fisherman. He ra was raised in a vocation. And so it wasn't that he was illiterate. Uh, he was actually very quite literate uh, in that we examined that he was quite a businessman. He must have spoken multiple languages. He had employees. He had a business. He handled money. He had a repair business. He had a boat maintenance business. He had uh, a food processing business. He was buying and selling. Uh, he was a man of great, of, of great uh, prominence in that community that he was in, uh, thus his selection, uh, but he just wasn't um, familiar with the mosaic system uh, for it was not taught to him. He was raised up in the vocation of his father. Uh, so it gives us a great understanding. And so I, 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 this is really a sidebar to uh, your background and, and getting to know you uh, in context to being able to present uh, this wonderful uh, dance that you take us on through the book of Jonah. Yeah, I, one, good, one good example I found is in, in the Beatitudes. You know, uh, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit, and in our English translations, they will inherit the earth. Um, but, uh, but if you look at the background in the Psalms, it's they'll inherit the land. Uh, now, against a, an Old Testament background, inheriting the land has all of those spiritual overtones of the promise to Abraham. It's not about world domination, which yeah. is what it sounds like if it's the meek will inherit the earth. It's about inheriting all of God's promises to Abraham uh, without having to, to push ourselves forward, which, of course, Abraham's a good model of, of somebody who waited by faith uh, at his best moments, sometimes not, not as meek as he should have been, uh, but looking for that land that God had promised him. Uh, and so that's a good example of, of how the Old Testament can really uh, clarify uh, some of our New Testament misunderstandings. Well, and it makes Genesis 15 come to life as understanding the inheritance. Mm. And for the Gentile believer, who now becomes a co-heir to the inheritance of Abraham, and it is a land and that land has borders and boundaries and is biblically mandated Israel. And this is a tangible inheritance given by a living father. You see, we tend to look at inheritance in the realm of the dead, in a leaving an inheritance, but uh, the, writer, the writer of the book of Hebrews makes a very strong point. He says, you pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you pray to the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And we know that the pagan religions prayed to the God of the dead, uh, but we were praying to the God of the living and encouraging the Jews who were believers at the time to be reminded of this is not, uh, we're not venerating the dead. Uh, we're venerating the living. They're alive in the kingdom of heaven, waiting mm. to return uh, with Messiah. Uh, and this is the great hope that Second Peter 3.15 talks about. What, what, what is the, the hope you have? It can't be 2,000 years old. It ha hope is a future tense. And so we get lost in trying to explain, well, my hope is in Jesus and the, that he died for my sins. No, that was, that's 2000, your hope is 2,000 years old. Your hope is dusty, and, 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 and it, it already was. 
No, my hope is in his return and as the conquering son of David and in the, in the renewal of what he called paradise, but it is Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, which was already clearly established as what paradise would be, what the new heaven, what the new earth, the river of life, the tree of life, all that makes so much sense that we would go, God had already introduced us to what it was going to look like. And we, we have that, we, and we know it because we were told it. Uh, but we, if we don't have that foundation in it, then we can't really put the pieces together. When Jesus right. says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, where is he going? He's going to Gan Eden, to the Garden of Eden. Uh, to that place of paradise. And so where is it? Uh, I strongly believe uh, deep under the Temple Mount that will be exposed at the Zechariah 14, the earthquake, the division, and what will be revealed. Uh, this will be the place of, of uh, the millennial reign, the, the, this, this beautiful picture that we have of... of uh, uh, this great plateau uh, of the Temple Mount uh, that Ezekiel talks about, uh, all preparing the way for uh, that Sabbath, 1,000 year, one day Sabbath rest uh, that is to come at the reign of Jesus, the ultimate defeat of sin and uh, the redemption of those who were faithful in their following of Messiah that we would have that glorified body. It's uh, quite a promise, and it's a promise that is actually reflected in the book of Jonah. Uh, this promise of what salvation looks like uh, is in this evangelical message as poorly presented as this very leaky vessel. Uh, not the boat that he was in, but the person of Jonah which is so much like all of us, we all leak, uh, spiritually leak, and uh, have to be shored up. Uh, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about when we return from the break. We're talking with Ian Duguid, uh, author of the book Jonah, The Gospel-Centered Life in the Bible. This is Grace for Sinners and Saints and takes us on an extraordinary journey through the person and the message of the reluctant prophet Jonah. You may identify as the reluctant prophet in your own family, in your own community, in your own church, or maybe a story that you think is science fiction and that there is a uh, great fish and could this really have happened and why did God include it? We'll have all those answers and more when we return from break. We'll be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light 
each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingANation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingANation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Ian DeGid, author of the book called Jonah, Grace for Sinners and Saints, part of the Gospel-Centered Life in the Bible series with the study guide and leader's notes. Ian, welcome back to this segment. Thank you. When we hear the name Jonah, <clears throat> everybody always jumps right to the fish. It seems to be that uh, Jonah is just one big fish story, and uh, that's where people get caught up in it, and they miss the essence of God's grace, God's mercy, and it's actually a foreshadowing of another time where Jesus is in the boat uh, asleep uh, during a storm, and it's kind of a foreshadowing of another story that's going to come that many people are much more familiar with than they are with the root origin, if you will, of the setting, uh, which we see repeated again in the New Testament. So uh, walk me through, if you will, your view of the motivation in writing this teaching on Jonah. Yeah, as you say, uh, people misunderstand the book of Jonah because they focus on the fish. This is what I call the vegetalization of, uh, of Christianity, where, where vegetales becomes our only access point to the Old Testament. Um, and, and it turns the Old Testament into nice, sweet, moral tales for, for children. But who could really believe that these sort of things actually happen? Um, of course, if you have a God who creates a universe out of nothing, if you have a God who raises the dead, then uh, the big fish is not the hard part of the story to, to wrestle with. In fact, there are lots of surprising things that happen in the story. Uh, you get, yeah, yeah, Jonah gets swallowed by the, the big fish, which is surprising. Uh, he survives that, which is also surprising. Uh, but the surprises start right at the beginning. The Lord calls a prophet to go do something, and he gets up and goes in entirely the opposite direction. Uh, He's running away from God. Uh, God does not strike him dead. You know, First Kings 13, when a prophet makes a, a, a minor deviation from what he's told to do, a lion comes and kills him on the way home. Uh, it's, it's, it's not so, so surprising that Jonah gets swallowed by the fish. The surprise is that he gets out alive after what he's done. Uh, and then he goes to Nineveh. Uh, and, and again, we, we, we don't know Nineveh. So that doesn't re resonate with us. But if you think Berlin in the 1930s and you send a Jewish prophet there to proclaim uh, the Lord's compassion upon them, uh, then you have some parallel to the, the Assyrians. The Assyrians are brutal killers. Uh, they glorify that in their wallpaper. The, the wall reliefs from, uh, from the palace in Nineveh uh, show piles of heads, people being flayed alive. That's the context into which God sent Jonah. 
uh, and he goes and he preaches uh, yeah, possibly the worst evangelistic message ever. 40 days and then it will be destroyed or overturned. Um, nothing about grace, nothing about hope, just you guys are done. Um, and yet, Nineveh repents. You know, they, 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 they do it in their own way. They're not really very confident about it, but they're so committed to it that they even dress their, their, their sheep and cattle in sackcloth and ashes. Um, and, uh, uh, and, but the story doesn't end there. The story ends with Jonah still mad about the fact that the Lord has not destroyed uh, Nineveh. And we see the Lord again dealing graciously with Jonah and uh, showing compassion to him. Jonah's sitting outside the city waiting for it to burn. Uh, meantime, he's the one who's burning. He's sitting out in the sun, uh, getting slowly toasted. And the Lord sends this plant to grow up in the, in the desert right next to him to provide him shade. And he's very happy about that. And then the Lord strikes the plant dead. And Jonah is starting to roast again. And he's angry about that. Uh, and the Lord says, yeah, you had compassion on that plant. You did nothing for that plant. And I have compassion on Nineveh. I'm the Lord. It's my right to do that. You said in chapter two, salvation is of the Lord. It's my right to have compassion on these people who really don't know their right hand from the left. They, they don't know what they're doing. Um, now, of course, the backdrop of, of this is generation after generation after generation of prophets coming to his own people. You know, Isaiah, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, they should be white as snow. What a beautiful presentation of the hope of repentance. And yet they didn't listen and didn't listen and didn't listen. That's, that's the real surprise in a sense that uh, and, and it proves the point that Jonah says in chapter 2 that salvation is of the Lord, that he can go to uh, the most unexpected group of people and bring them to repentance. And, and the good news of that, of course, to people uh, uh, to whom God has been sending prophets time and time again, is that if God can do it for Nineveh, then he can even do it for his own people. Uh, if the Lord turns the hearts of his people back to him, uh, and then you know turns them to him they humble themselves uh, and they look to the Lord then they too can experience the same grace and mercy uh, that the Ninevites experienced and that Jonah himself experienced you know when he's asked by those aboard ship in the midst of this storm who is he <clears throat> and he responds that he is a Hebrew now, this was the message that Joseph sent from prison to, through the baker to, uh, I'm sorry, through the cupbearer to say, re remember me <clears throat> to Pharaoh uh, when you, when this becomes fulfilled, that you are restored to your position. Remember <clears throat> that I am a Hebrew and that I was taken not by will. Uh, but, but, but I was but I was taken captive, and uh, even during the progression of his um, um, acting as the Grand Vizier, if you will, of Egypt, he's still not. He, he doesn't dine with with the Egyptians because it's against their culture for them to dine with the Hebrews. So he spends his entire existence eating by himself. And then when his brothers come, it continues that they are separated from him and he is separated from them. And they look at it because the servants are unworthy to sit with the Grand Vizier, them not knowing that the reason they're shunning him is because he's a Hebrew and they're shunning yeah. the brothers because they're Hebrews. And this establishment of I am a Hebrew uh, has a connotation of something being different. We're, <clears throat> we're not supposed to be idol worshipers, but it's exactly what got us caught up in the Jeremiah narrative of the 70 years of exile uh, in 586 to Babylonian captivity that actually... Um, our tongue uh, was removed. Uh, Hebrew died as a language replaced by Aramaic. 
and it wasn't until the late 1800s that Hebrew was revived. It was a dead language because of the idolatry of the Hebrews. So now you um, even look today at an assimilated uh, entity of people like myself that are Jewish, uh, but we're scattered. There's only 14 million of us, and we're scattered all over the world. Uh, we, we make up, uh, we still don't make up a majority uh, yet in Israel, working towards that, but we're, gonna, we're going to get there. Um, <clears throat> so they recognized, uh, based on what, I'm sa he, what he said as he identified himself as a Hebrew, that he was something that they had some knowledge of, some awareness of. So the reputation of the Hebrews preceded him uh, and uh, the, the um, uh, posture, the position, the power, the omniscience of the God that he served uh, was one that they understood could stir up such a storm that, that they, they had, they, although they were pagans, uh, they had knowledge of this God the Hebrews served. How does that play into the narrative in the larger scheme of understanding the, um, the Jews were called to be a light to the world and we didn't do it. We were called to protect the oracles of God and the fact that you have a Bible, we did do it. So there's things we accomplished and there's things we did not accomplish, uh, which is why we have this diaspora and why we still have this to be fulfilled promise that uh, at some point all of Israel will be saved. But how does his identification as a Hebrew um, change the narrative within the Jonah story? Yeah, well, he says, I, I'm a Hebrew, I serve the God who created the, the, the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land. And, and the sailors uh, are having a vivid demonstration in front of them of God's power over the sea. Uh, and he's the one who's sovereign over whether, when and whether they're going to get back to dry land. Um, again, the irony is that if Jonah obeys God at the beginning of chapter one and goes and preaches straight away to Nineveh, the pagan sailors never get to see this. And chapter one ends with, and Jonah doesn't get to see this. Chapter one ends with these pagan sailors vowing vows and sacrificing to the Lord. Um, so Jonah's sin becomes the means by which God is going to show mercy to a, to a bunch of pagan Gentile sailors. Um, isn't that just like God? Uh, even even when we sin, uh, salvation is still of the Lord, and and He can use our running away from Him. Uh, to uh, to accomplish his purposes uh, in a beautiful way. Now, the, the pagan sailors don't even get to see the whole of the story. Uh, their, their last sight is Jonah disappearing beneath the waves. Um, we, as far as we know, they didn't even know that he got swallowed by the fish. But they saw the power of the Lord in the storm, and they saw that storm suddenly stilled when Jonah was tossed into the water, uh, and that convinced them, here's a God to be reckoned with. Um, you referenced earlier Jesus stilling the storm. Uh, that's the power of, of, of God at work. Uh, you know, the storm is, and, the, and the sea, particularly the chaotic sea in the Old Testament, is such a vivid image of uh, the force of chaos that are opposed to God. Uh, and yet in the temple, of course, it's domesticated. That the powerful sea becomes this calm pool of water that the priests use for the cleansing. Uh, as a sign of God's power over the forces of nature. Uh, well, the sailors saw that worked out. The disciples saw that worked out. And, and it's not surprising that after that, the disciples are saying to one another, who is this that even the wind and waves obey him? Uh, and they, they're, they're starting to put two and two together and recognize that this Jesus, uh, this Jesus is able to do the stuff that the Lord does in the Old Testament. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't simply pray and ask God to still the storm. Jesus says the storm be still. You know, no prophet could do that. Uh, no priest could do that. Only God is able to, uh, to do that. 
You know, that dominion uh, is extraordinary. One, one of the things we see which is kind of subtle, uh, but yet becomes quite thematic, is the uh, casting of lots. Mm. And uh, this is something that has uh, an earlier origin, and then it has a much later application uh, all the way through the casting of lots for Jesus' garments, uh, the casting of lots, uh, the drawing, casting of lots for uh, Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, the father of John the Baptist, drawing lots cast, as they did was the tradition of the 24 divisions of 1,000 priests for who would perform the services in the temple uh, as opposed to all of the other jobs, many jobs that were required 24 divisions of 1,000 priests to just maintain the cleaning up and the, the um, considerable amount of work of dealing with blood and the entrails and all those things with the sacrificial system. Uh, but the drawing of lots uh, became uh, the origin of, uh, of course, uh, tradition for uh, the playing out of the story of Esther uh, and in um, uh, the uh, the Hanukkah story, the the Maccabee uh, revolt, uh, there's just so many uh, different applications of us thinking that it is, uh, and and humanity has an attraction with the mystical, uh, with the chance, with the random uh, luck. Uh, with things which might involve divination and uh, all of the mancies, necromancy and, and uh, acromancy and, and aquamancy and, and all those different uh, dark arts, if you will, uh, that the fate of an individual was by chance. It was by the casting, by the drawing of the short straw or the short stick. Uh, it's, it's fascinating and it is essential uh, to the story of Jonah. Uh, the book of Proverbs says that the, lap, the lot is cast in the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Uh, and we clearly see that here. Uh, and, and we could add to that the tradition uh, of, of the Day of Atonement Festival, when the, of the two goats that were taken, lots were drawn as to which one would be sacrificed and which one would be driven out into the wilderness, out into the outer darkness. Uh, that too is, is from the Lord. Um, it's, it's fascinating in the Gospels that uh, Caiaphas, the high priest for that year, is the one who designates Jesus to be the Day of Atonement sacrifice, saying it's better for one man to die than the whole nation. Um, that, that whole uh, uh, aspect, pointing forward to Christ, as the former form of both goats of the Day of Atonement. He both bears our sins through his blood that is offered in the Holy of Holies, the heavenly Holy of Holies, uh, but he also takes our sins, and as far as the East is from our West, so far does he remove our sins from us. Uh, you know, both of those goats in their own way point forward to the way that Christ is going to fulfill uh, God's purposes. So here, Jonah is, yeah, he's, he's the disobedient prophet. He's not the, he's, he, he's in a sense sacrificing himself for the sake of the sailors, but in a dis disobedient way. It's sort of his, his, his last uh, way of saying to God, okay, you can kill me, but I'm still not going to go preach to Nineveh. And the Lord says, you can't even die without my permission. Uh, I'll make sure that, that the sailors know that it, this is you, and they'll toss you overboard, uh, and they'll use that in their lives, but you're not going to be allowed to die. We can't even kill ourselves without God, God's permission. Um, and uh, Jonah is therefore rescued and delivered and sent back on his way to accomplish God's purpose to save those whom he will save. From a historical perspective, uh, the book of Jonah establishes two very, very clear um, and profound messages. One is, is that the argument of my traditional non-believing Jewish community is that one man cannot save 
the nation. One man can't save the world. So this belief in a Messiah, Savior, uh, Messiah, uh, is a false hope uh, when we see that it was uh, one man, Abraham. It was one man, Moses. It was one man, Noah. It was one woman, Esther. It was one man, Jonah. Uh, there's always the singularity. It's not a group that brings salvation. It's one. And God has always used the power of one, which is uh, a uh, reflection of the one true God, that there's not a multiplicity of gods, that this compound unity is not three gods. We don't pray to three entities. We pray to God the Father, and it's clearly established in Scripture. The second aspect of uh, uh, the story of Jonah is the establishment of three days and three nights, and this becomes very critical in the narrative of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus and right. sets the time and the reference point uh, 500 years later to something that would be considered to be of antiquity or even what today might be considered mythology. Uh, but he clearly validates the... Uh, um, truth of the story of Jonah in his proclamation of uh, the only sign you will receive is the sign of Jonah. Right. Uh, it's extraordinary that it validates something that even today people argue, did this really happen? And you have the witness of Jesus himself declaring that not only did this happen, but I'm using it as a marker and a reference point for you to set time, set your clock, set your watch. You'll see. Yeah, so it's, it's fascinating. It, you know, Jonah is a real historical person. We know about Jonah from Second Kings. Uh, he's already already been on a mission to Jeroboam the second before he's called to this mission So Jonah is a real historical person if the story of jo book of Jonah is not true If it did not actually happen then Jonah has a claim against the Bible for defamation of character. Yes Because the biblical Jonah is you know is a faithful prophet uh, And if he if he never did any of the things that are told us in the book of Jonah Then then we have slandered him the Bible has slandered him. The Bible is not in the business of slandering people. If this is not a true story, uh, then, then yeah, we'd have to say the Bible has slandered him, and it has not. So it must be a true story. Uh, and yeah, in antiquity, a three-day journey was how long it took to go to Sheol uh, in, in popular thinking. So Jonah has this trip to the gates of Sheol um, and, and then returns to, to bring a message that uh, ends up transforming a people um, in spite of himself. Uh, and so in that way, he, he foreshadows in a profound sense uh, the, the ultimately redemptive uh, ministry of Christ through his death and resurrection three days later uh, to bring this message of salvation that is not simply, okay, God's going to destroy you, but it, it is a message of salvation uh, in Christ that brings us to this relationship with God that we were designed to have, that uh, there was the purpose of God calling Abraham and Sarah all the way back in Genesis 12, and his promise to uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15. It's a confirmation, a confirmation, and a confirmation of the inerrancy of God's Word, the consistency of God's Word, and that's what determines what's the difference between mythology and the inerrancy of God's word. Uh, Jewish tradition says that we write the word, we count the letters, we say the word, we count the letters, and that every scroll must have the same number of letters in it, and that has been our tradition uh, for thousands of years, dating back prior to the Essenes uh, at Qumran, uh, that have given us the Dead Sea Scrolls that we can count the letters of every Torah scroll and the number of letters is the same and therefore we know there's been no changes to it. Uh, we know of no other document in history where such a thing exists 
that it hasn't been altered just a little bit. There just haven't been an embellishment, a little bit added into the story. Uh, we know because of the number of letters uh, contained within each one of the scrolls is the same, and that is the responsibility of the one writing it. Uh, it Jonah is one of the characters that I would love to interview to ask, you know, what did you see? What did you think? What was your experience down there? Okay, so now you're spewed forth and it's, it's clear that you're supposed to present this message and you, and you certainly um, in, in the um, pattern of a Moses without saying, uh, listen, pick somebody else. I'm, I'm not very good at this. Um, you just proved you're not really very good at this. But God's really good at this. And mm -hmm. so in, 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 where you are weak, he is strong, is kind of the ultimate glory of this message of uh, the broken vessel delivering the complete message as clumsily and as uh, ineloquently as you possibly could. Yeah, I, if I were to meet with Moses, my question would be, okay, so what happened after the end of chapter four? <laughs> did, did, it, did it all make sense finally and you repented before the Lord or did you stay hard-hearted? I guess if I meet Moses, I got my answer. Right. He repented. Uh, I think that the... The, the writer book deliberately leaves us hanging there because he says it's not really about Moses, about Jonah. The question is, what are you going to do with this, reader? You know, the challenge is to you. Uh, Jonah did whatever he did, but the Lord is speaking to you, and he's saying to you, now is the day for you to repent. You've heard the gospel message m much more clearly than, than the Ninevites did. Uh, are you going to remain angry like uh, Jonah, and are you going to stay outside? Uh, just because God has grace to people who you don't think he should have grace to, uh, Gentiles, uh, unbelieving, uh, you know, undeserving Gentiles, or are you willing to accept that the Lord is a God of grace and mercy, who shows mercy to whom he will show mercy, and has compassion on whom he will have compassion? And that could even be you. Well, it, it, it is a great message. It is a uh, great study. Uh, for those who want to get started uh, learning how to study the Bible, uh, Ian has done an extraordinary job of giving you a study guide uh, to walk you through one of the shorter books of the Bible, four chapters, uh, but profound understanding that kind of give you um, some of the keys you need on your key ring in order to unlock some of the mysteries of the scriptures to put them into context that you can understand and apply and examine your own walk with the Lord to determine your own needs as a community uh, or as an individual. Uh, I highly recommend it and I thank you Ian DeGeed for writing this and putting this together. It's entitled Jonah, Grace for Sinners and Saints. It's a study guide with leaders notes it's in the Gospel-Centered Life in the Bible series, and it's just one of the great uh, study guides put out by New Growth Press. And I know that uh, we look forward to having you back on because you're not stopping here uh, with Jonah. I know that you've got many more within you. So we thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Ezra and Nehemiah in the future, which will be fun. Well, I can't wait. Two, two of my favorites uh, that established a whole lot of Jewish doctrine uh, and a whole lot of uh, things we are actually fighting against today. Uh, and that is, uh, who, what is a Jew? Who is a Jew and what is a Jew? Uh, is a question that they, they bring uh, some um, question mark. They're the origin of the question mark at the end of that statement. Uh, up until this point of Ezra and Nehemiah, we're pretty clear what it was to be a Jew. They introduce a new model into the narrative that says, huh, hadn't thought about the plundering and the raping and the pillaging and the identification of who exactly is a Jew and what is that lineage. 
But uh, I'm excited and I will look forward to having you back on to talk Thank about you. that very subject. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. We're going to take a short break and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.